Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program and Initiation of Age-Friendly Health Systems Using the Four M's. I'll use the acronym GWEP throughout this presentation. GWEP is an initiative that will transform the care of the elder adult patient from a model in which patients passively receive care to a model in which our elder patients are reseeded as decision makers in their health care. If you have ever been frustrated at the passivity of your patient and said, help me to help you, this is a model you will truly come to appreciate. GWEP is funded through HRSA. One of the major goals of the grant is the promotion of an age-friendly health system throughout the United States. The age-friendly health care is a concept pioneered by the John A. Hartford Foundation and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in partnership with the American Hospital Association, the Catholic Health Association of the United States, Kaiser Permanente, Trinity, and Ascension. I have no relevant affiliations or disclosures. Learning objectives. We will explore the gestalt of the age-friendly health system how age-friendly healthcare and MIPS are greater than the sum of their parts. I'll explain the 4Ms framework and how integration into primary care optimizes geriatric care. I'll attempt to aid your understanding of the GWEP initiative and how it applies to the age-friendly health system. And finally, we'll discuss implementation. The merit-based incentive payment system is the nuts and bolts of an age-friendly health system and the way we measure the success of our implementation. The purpose of the GWEP initiative and our goal at NSU along with our community partners is to devise an age-friendly health system to improve health outcomes for older adults by creating an age-friendly healthcare system beginning with a mindset. We will devise an age-friendly health system that improves health outcomes for older adults by integrating geriatrics with primary care using the 4Ms framework. We'll develop a healthcare workforce that maximizes patient and family engagement. We'll develop designated healthcare community clinical sites as age-friendly, and we'll collaborate with GWEP, clinical educators, and clinical partners to achieve this designation by assessment, planning, and evaluation of age-friendly health systems implementation using the 4Ms framework. As the golden um, as the movers and shakers of the current gene generation into, into retirement, their golden years, they become increasingly vulnerable to the vicissitudes of age. Keeping in mind that patients are self-determining individuals assists us to care for them in a manner that respects and honor them. Patients are the experts in what they want from healthcare and clinicians are the experts in how to get them there. There's an urgent need of age-friendly healthcare the number of adults, individuals ages 65 years and older is growing rapidly. In 2019, the US Census recorded 54 million individuals over 65 years of age. One out of five Florida residents are greater than 65 years old. And as we age, care often becomes more complex. It has been shown that older adults suffer a disproportionate amount of harm while in the care of the health system. That's unacceptable and our goal is to change that trajectory. The benefits of becoming an age-friendly health system are not always apparent. I hear you thinking that's all well and good, but we just don't have the time. Understood, time is money. Part of my work here is to reveal ways to efficiently gather this information while covering the costs of your valuable time and ultimately, but even better, knowing your patients are happier and better off. What follows is a quick brief on documentation and coding. Negatively, we want to avoid personal and financial cost of poor quality care. Adverse medication events, decreased patient quality of life, emergency room visits, hospitalization, and increased mortality. Poor care impacts patient quality of life as well as institutional ratings, insurance ratings, and reimbursements. Positively, the age-friendly health system improves the patient experience. Improved scores equal improved value enhanced care, thus assisting in meeting CMS quality measurement measures, improvement measures. Value enhancing care will lead to an improved reputation, increased reimbursement and increased market share. To reap the benefits of an age-friendly health system, 
we first need to engage each patient that is due an annual wellness visit. This would be for the patient's benefit as well for reimbursement purposes. A yearly annual wellness visit increases the probability of a subsequent visit concerning advanced care planning from 19.8% to 38.1%, thereby adding to the financial gains. The goal would be to achieve 90% of annual wellness visits for eligible beneficiaries each year, which contributes both to best practice and to increase patient well-being. We are falling short of reaching the numbers of patients who would benefit from an annual wellness exam. An annual wellness exam also presents the opportunity for 25 billable preventative screenings that may be prescribed for under Medicare Part B. These would be alcohol misuse, fall, depression, colorectal screening, prostate, breast screening, bone density, et cetera. What is covered is easily found under CMS preventative screening services. I'll also mention that the length of the annual visit increases, thereby giving us more time for all this lovely quality healthcare. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, Age-Friendly Health System Overview. The goal is to offer elder adults safe health care, taking into account what matters to them. We are following the model for improvement developed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Using the 4Ms framework as a guide to reframe how providers and support staff working as a team approaches patients will help the patient and family working in concert with providers to evaluate whether they are living their best life. The 4Ms framework helps us as their healthcare providers to see patients as individuals who have specific concerns that matter to them. The GWEP initiative focuses on four primary concerns impacting patients, and these will be explored in upcoming slide. What matters is a discussion that aids them to clarify core issues that add value to their lives. Medications. Question is, are medications taking, taken, aiding or hindering them to do what matters to them? Mentation. Do they have clarity of thinking that aids them in doing what matters? And mobility, is their level of mobility aiding or hindering achievement of what matters? Recall that the four M's are not an overlay or addition to usual geriatric care. Rather, they are synergistic and reinforce one another. The four M's offer a new way of organizing care for older adults by ensuring that essentials are covered consistently in every setting that care is delivered. Consistency leading to continuity of care with best outcomes. Healthcare that achieves patient health outcome goals ensure that care is based on what matters to most to older adults according to established quality measures. That would be connecting with family and friends, enjoying life such as hobbies, personal growth, being productive, making end of life decisions. That would be healthcare surrogates or advanced care directives making health, self-care, and managing health, self-care, and medications. The ability to think clearly and maintaining mobility are all matters that are vital to the elder patient. Medication. It is vital to update, update the medication list at each visit. This is not to ask if it has anything changed. This is to discuss in, de in depth each medication. Discuss with them whether medications taken are helping or hindering them in reaching personal goals for self-care, socializing, mobility, and mentation goals. Ask them if they are taking medications that are hindering their goals. Evaluate their understanding of how and why they are taking each medication. And consider deprescribing. Are all the medications necessary? May any medications be safely stopped? Reducing unwanted or harmful medications is key. Also, ask them if they are taking medications that have been ordered. Maximize doses before adding additional medications and avoid duplication of same class medications. Use age-friendly medication that is not known to interfere with what matters, mentation, or mobility. Check out the Beers criteria. Medication use and risk. While 12% of the population of the United States are 65 years and older, 34% of prescription medications are used among individuals in this age group. 30% of all over-the-counter drugs and herbal supplements are used by those over 65 years of age. The potential for adverse drug reaction increases as numbers of medications used and mental medical conditions increase. 
renal and hepatic function decline, compound chance of ADR. And serious ADR may be confusion, delirium, depression, malnutrition, and falls. About 60% of elderly take prescriptions improperly, resulting in approximately 140,000 deaths per, per year. The first consideration is that of necessity. Is this medication necessary? Are there alternative modalities? Recommend lifestyle modifications before prescribing medications. Polypharmacy is present if the individual is taking more than five medications in a day. And the second consideration is safety. Is this medication safe in this age group? What are the potential harmful side effects? Third is the benefit versus, versus risk value. Are the side effects worth the usage of these medications? And be aware that pre-marketing trials often exclude geriatric patients due to age-related pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. The American Geriatric Society Beers Criteria. The Beers Criteria was named for Dr. M.H. Beers, principal author of the original 1991 criteria. It is a list of potentially hazardous medications for patients over 65 years of age with guidelines for healthcare professionals to help improve the safety of the medication profile prescribed for older adults. Be aware that the Beers criteria does not apply to hospice or palliative care. To paraphrase Dr. Michael Steinman, a co-chair of the American Geriatric Society Beers Criteria Panel, the AGS Beers criteria should never dictate how medications are prescribed nor should it dictate what medications are prescribed. This tool works best as a starting point for a discussion. Some of the medications that are potentially inappropriate for older adults include anticholinergic medications. This class would include Benadryl, Vistaril, Chlortrimetron, and antispasmodics such as dicyclamine and scopolamine. Note that all drugs with anticholinergic properties block acetylcholine receptors. Chronic interference with acetylcholine receptors is harmful to all individuals, especially to speak to the population of our focus, the elder adult. Acetylcholine plays a role in motivation, arousal, attention, learning, and memory. It's also involved in promoting REM sleep. Studies have shown that elderly individuals taking acetylchol um, anticholinergic drugs were at an increased risk for cognitive decline and dementia. Discontinuing anticholinergic treatment is associated with a decreased risk of cognitive decline. Alpha blockers and alpha antagonists such as doxazosin, clonidine, likewise have side effects that are hazardous to the elder adult, orthostasis, uh, central nervous system interruption, and bradycardia. Antirhythmic agents such as amiodarone are known to be toxic to the thyroid and lungs. Anti-Parkinsonian agents, such as benzotropine and artane, have side effects of drowsiness, dizziness, constipation, and dry mouth. Benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepine hypnotics, and sulfonylurea are all known to have side effects that impact older adults adversely. Mentation. Evaluate mentation with an eye to cultural differences. Misunderstandings may color your opinion. What would you think of this man's mentation? If he walked into your office, would it change if you knew he were from Bulgaria? Screening for cognitive impairment is part of a Met Welcome to Medicare first exam visit and Medicare annual exam. Normalize evaluation of mentation like we do vital signs. Evaluate focus and concentration, evaluate sleep efficiency, and evaluate general well-being. There are a multitude of cognitive exams. Here at NOVA, we use the St. Louis University Mental Status Examination, also known as SLUMS. We have the Mini Cog and the Mini Mental Status Exam. Depression is linked to dementia. It is vital to screen for and treat depression. Some of our screening tools are the PHQ-2, the PHQ-9, and the Geriatric Depression Screen. Factors influencing depression include poor diet, poor sleep, lifestyle, medication, isolation, alcohol intake, and genetics. Notice that the preponderance of these are modifiable factors. 
Here's a slide that discusses delirium, depression, and dementia. The evaluation of delirium, depression, and dementia should include a thorough history, physical exam, lab work, and evaluation of medications. Metabolic imbalances such as hypothyroidism and nutritional deficiencies such as vitamin B12 deficiency are common in the elderly and may cause memory impairment and should be tested for and treated if abnormal. After physiology is accounted for, the most important thing to remember about dementia versus delirium is that delirium has an abrupt onset. Your role is to look for a trigger. It may be dehydration, infection, a new medication, or change of environment. Dementia is a chronic and progressive deterioration of cognition. Have family caregivers offer assurance to the elderly, keep sensory devices in use such as eyeglasses and hearing aids, keep mobility devices such as cane and walker handy, and avoid sleep interruptions and avoid unnecessary medications at all costs. Depression is often found in the elderly, but it is not considered normal rather is linked to life changes, loss, poor health, and diet. All items that may be subject to interventions such as healthy diet, exercise, and connections with friends and family. The provider role is to screen for complicating factors and treat modifiable factors, and in the case of dementia, offer caregiver support. Mobility is the fourth leg of the 4Ms framework. I love this acronym, MOVE. Mobility optimizes virtually everything. Mobility is the linchpin for doing what matters. It impacts well-being, mentation, self-care, and enjoyment of life. As a provider, do your best to get them moving. In your older adults, assess how social distancing is affecting mobility and daily functioning. What is the individual doing to stay mobile? Are they using assistive devices? And what are their mobility goals? Then act. Offer aid in the form of devices or referrals for physical therapy or occupational therapy to evaluate the home environment and to improve their mobility. Try to ensure that adults move safely every day in order to maintain function and do what matters to them. The Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, MIPS for short. These are CMS quality measures that impact Medicare reimbursement. So what we've been exploring up until now is age-friendly healthcare and the four M's. The age-friendly healthcare and the four M's is the framework used in the dynamic reimagining of patient-centered care where our patients are reseated as decision makers and providers act to guide and support them in living their best life. MIPS is the measure of how well we are instituting the age-friendly healthcare. The quality measures we aim to impact at Nova Southeastern University our advanced care planning and what matters, screening for opioid misuse, dementia disease and caregiver support, fall risk, blood pressure control, and diabetes control as measured by the A1C. Advanced care planning coding for reimbursement was approved by CMS January 1, 2016. These reimbursement codes are for discussion of goals and preferences for care, complex medical decision Decision-making regarding life-threatening or life-limiting illnesses are also included. Engaging family members or surrogates as clinical decisions, situations arise is likewise covered. If you consider the table, the descriptions, components, documentation, and workforce roles are explored. There are no limits established by CMS on the number of times you can report advanced care planning for a given beneficiary within a given period of time. There are no diagnosis requirements and forms may or may not be completed. However, to achieve best practice and secure reimbursement, documentation should include some detail as to the conversation, those decision makers involved, and time spent. This may include concerning diagnoses, cognitive impairment, and stage renal disease, or initially no definitive diagnosis is necessary. But for repeated use of the advanced care planning code, there should be a diagnosis and comment as the patient condition. Billing may occur on the same day as an annual wellness visit, a newer established patient, patient visit, transitional care visit, preventative visits, or medication visits. There are no restrictions for outpatient situations. However, you would not report 99497 
499-498 on the same date of services as critical care services are coded for. So if you consider the table, we have the description, which is a voluntary discussion of healthcare wishes, may be reported unlimited number of times, covered in the Medicare annual wellness visit. Outside of the Medicare annual wellness visit, Part B cost sharing applies, and there's no place of service limitations. It can be a telehealth visit all as well. The charges for 99498, um, NOVA charges $130 for the first 30 minute visit. And then if there's an additional 130 minutes required to speak to out of town family or further discussion with family members, there's an additional $113 charge that may be applied by NOVA. Um, like I said, it can be a face-to-face -face service, includes telehealth, advanced care discussion, patient care gets, where, when, healthcare surrogates, discussion with the patient family members or surrogate, the documentation, who's involved in the discussion, what was discussed, why was it discussed, and the time spent. The workforce, the clinical staff can offer the advanced care planning paperwork and explain it. The provider and the, or the physician, physician or non-physician uh, must bill for it. Opioid misuse. Defined as use of medication, prescription drugs without a prescription or used in a way other than what, what is prescribed. Screen for misuse in the opioid risk tool is found under the navigation tab on the left of your screen in NextGen. Before prescribing, evaluate alternatives, Tylenol. Be sure to get vitamin D level therapeutic levels. Consider counteracting pain by decreasing inflammation with agents such as omega-3 fatty acids, turmeric, curcumin, anti-inflammatory diets, and advise them that smoking, alcohol, high carbohydrate diets increase, increase pain and inflammation in the body. Document an opioid risk screening tool and document the conversation with your patient in your note for full reimbursement. Dementia caregiver support. In the case of caregivers of those with dementia, offer resources to aid in coping and caring for themselves and their loved ones. The Alzheimer's Association offers many free, much free education and training for patients and caregivers to aid in recognition and managing symptoms for, from the early to the late stages. Find the Alzheimer's education tool in NextGen and attach to the encounter. This type of documentation increases value-based care and reimbursement credit and also allows us to track our how well we're doing with this measure. The online tools um, through alzheimersnavigation.org, there's online support groups, free online courses, free online library, online resources to aid in developing action plans to guide decision making, encourage caregivers to consider adult daycare programs, consider respite care, they may offer short-term relief of hours duration or for entire weekends. Consider in-home services. Fall risk assessment. The medical assistant is able to screen for recent falls or recent injury from falls within the past year. If there has been a fall, document first in the history of present illness, then under health promotions and Medicare preventative. Optimal blood pressure goals are below 140 over 80, and over 120 over 70. The blood pressure over 140 over 90 is associated with a 53% increased risk of ischemic stroke and an 85% increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke. A blood pressure below 120 over 70 is likewise linked to adverse events. Diabetes indicators are linked to fasting blood sugar and A1C. According to the American Diabetic Association, a fasting blood sugar over 125 or an A1C greater than 6.4% constitutes a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. The, at the initial visit, offer education, recommend diet and lifestyle modifications before offering medication. Follow up the A1C every three months and treat as indicated. The goal for the A1C, according to the American Geriatric Society, is 7.5 to 8 as an upper limit. If complex illnesses or life expectancy of less than 10 years are present, then the A1C is liberalized up to 
8 to 8.5 percent. Initiate therapy with metformin and avoid sulfonylureas if possible. Use of the EMR. MIPS are one of the measure of effective implement implementation of the age-friendly health system. Documentation is key. Implementation of the four M's are effectively realized when NSU meets MIPS quality benchmarks. MIPS adjusts Medicare Part B payments based on performance in four performance categories. That would be quality, cost, promoting interoperability, and improvement activities. The six measures that NSU has focused on in the GWEP initiative are advanced care planning, screening for opioid misuse, dementia disease caregiver support, fall risk, blood pressure control, diabetes control as measured by the A1C. These meet those four quality measures required Meeting these measures also assures that NSU will be certified as an age-friendly health system while enhancing financial reimbursement. Quality elder care that will measurably increase financial reimbursement and market share while most importantly, improving the health and well-being of our older adult population is our goal. Ultimately, the goal is to help those under our care to live a life that is as full and rich as possible. After you document your visit, code for maximum reimbursement and close your charts. This is the expression you wanna recall when you sit around the table and consider the impact on those you, who have come to you for care that day. If you have any questions, you can email me at dk644 at nova.edu. And remember, becoming an age-friendly health system has a multitude of tangible financial rewards, but try to reimagine the healthcare system. The richest rewards are intangible, making the world a friendlier, safer place for those venerated elders walking among us. Please take a moment and use the link provided by scanning with your phone camera We'll take you to the survey, allow us to document your presence in this course, and as well as to offer your opinions. Thank you.